<laughs> Indeed, me too. So thank you all for joining us uh, today. I'm Alex Chisnell from uh, Festival of Enterprise. I'm also a fellow business owner like most of you are going to be on here today. Um, so interested in the questions that you've been posting up. Um, and Piers can see all those. If you if you enter them in the live chat, Piers will be able to see them as well. We've got a bunch to, to answer already. Um, how many of you joined us last week for, for the webinar? We had a crazy number of people on, on last week. Um, so Piers is going to be covering um, how business owners, entrepreneurs can manage the current crisis, as well as what you can do in isolation, uh, which we are all in. Um, those of you who don't know, I'll let Piers do an intro, but he's a um, former investor on BBC's Dragons Den. He's been a a banker, a lawyer, um, non-exec direct, uh, director of the British Business Bank as well, and a business leader awards judge. I think that covers it, Piers. Um, yeah, I think the key takeaways is that in my experience as a you know, venture capital lawyer, corporate finance lawyer, corporate financier, investment banker, hedge fund manager, venture capitalist, uh, leverage buyouts, anything basically, entrepreneur in good times, bad times, I've had to put companies that I've invested into administration, my own businesses, sadly, is that I basically sat on every side of the table, every mm. on my end of the table, a round table. Um, so I've got I've got a perspective or a view and opinion on um, on almost anything you may have to, any question you may have to ask around business. And I know a bit about C-bills, you want to ask questions about that as well. And um, that's my, my personal opinion. I'm not here officially on behalf of British Business Bank, but I am a non-executive director. So I've been pretty close to that. And I think what we can also cover as well is, is business as well, but also I think, you know, th this is a time where you talk about the practicalities of what you do with your business and also about, you know, surviving at home and maybe thinking about uh, rebuilding, restarting a business or even starting a new business and how you go about doing that. But I think um, in most small businesses, and I guess most people on a, have got a small business or thinking about starting one, um, time is of the essence, you know, there's no point in talking about some kind of um, you know white horse is going to appear in three months if you can't do next month's payroll. So I think we can talk about the you know the, the stuff that's out there in terms of help for the government, but also it's quite useful to talk about practicalities because you know for a lot of small businesses that that day is coming. Yeah, with, without a doubt, and there's good advice on on last week's uh, webinar as well. I think those businesses that can. Uh, Mothball, be proactive, get ahead of the game, and they're going to be the ones that um, survive. Obviously, everybody here is in very, very different situations. Um, really good turnout rate on today's webinar. Again, it's going up by the minute. Um, I'll start off um, to have a look at a couple of the questions. Um, yeah, if you pick them out, and I'll. Okay. So um, this one comes. It seems to. Where is this? Let's go. Let me give you a bit of a, a bit of a thought. So yeah, question. So. I've been asked a lot, I was talking to a journalist yesterday about, you know, what do you think is going to happen? And, and the key is this, right, um, a bit of an opener, is if you've got a, a well-established business that um, could probably raise debt finance, for example, and has now got a problem and needs some working capital, you will probably find it reasonably straightforward to go and talk to a bank and get a standard commercial loan or one backed by Siebel's. If you've got a business that is unprofitable, um, its revenues are very uncertain, it's very hard to, to formulate a plan that holds water that shows how you trade out of this, or you're small, you're new, you're thinking of starting a business, then you know debt is just debt doesn't work for you. If you really are starting out, you may want to talk to a startup loans company. They do personal loans up to 25k per founder, so that's worth a conversation. But in most cases for small businesses, you know, that debt is not really applicable. So then you get into well, what is? Uh, and then you've got you saw maybe articles in the press over the weekend about venture capital backed back businesses. So these are companies that um, have had investors. It might be venture capital, angel investors. You hear, you know, pre-seed, seed investment, which is early investment, or even real venture funds that have kind of shut up shop for the time being. They may be able to go and raise finance um, from their existing investors to tide them over or structure some kind of instrument like a convertible loan if you've crowdfunded you know those platforms are closed right now uh, in terms of most um, people trying to raise money but again there's access to finance now if you're not really suitable for debt you haven't really got that kind of equity um, um sort of track record in terms of think about equity is there's no no one's ever going to invest in your business if you're never going to sell it the investors what they do they get out of businesses by listing on the stock market and selling the shares 
or they sell the company for cash or some other consideration and that they get their investments out. So if you're building a business where your intention is never to sell it, you want to pass it on to your children or do it for the next, you know, the rest of your life, that's not suitable for equity investment. So it's those businesses are the ones that have the biggest problem because there's no easy way of anyone, the government, or whoever it may be, structuring some solution to provide a, a, a financing um, facility. Equity involves a lot of risk. They need to know, you know, let's be fair, is your business one worth investing in for an investor? How long will it take? How do they get their money back? They've got to do due diligence, legal due diligence, commercial due diligence, financial due diligence. It takes six months. So that doesn't really work. And I think that's where it's worth having a, a practical conversation about what the hell do you do? You know, how do you survive? How do you mothball? And the point is this, is that if you imagine there's sort of a wave coming into shore, and you're behind it, trying to see the shore, so you know where you need to get to, you, we don't really know how tall that swell, that wave is going to be. We don't know how long it's going to take to get into the shore because we can't see over it. We don't know what the crest of that wave looks like in terms of the pandemic and its mm. economic effects on business and the economy generally. And what's going to happen over the next you know, few weeks, hopefully, is that we'll begin to see that you know, the, the actual pandemic itself, that curve is hopefully flattened. And then we'll begin to be able to see over it. So we have to say, well, in one, two, three months, this is going to happen. In six months, we'll be here. And in 12 months or 18 months, whatever it is, there'll be a vaccine. So you begin to be able to plan and see the shore. And if you've got a small business in one of those situations where, you know, the, the government's um, help supporting employees, maybe they're paying 80% of POAE or um, it's helping you, but you still have a huge hole. That's worth talking about because you want to try and survive one way or the other to get to the top of that crest. So at least then you can see the shore and start to plan. Until you know how far away it is or how high this, this uh, wave is going to be, it's impossible to plan. It's hard to write a business plan. It's hard to go and talk to debt finances or your shelves about well, how much money do I need? You don't know how big the hole is. And I think that's what's worth talking about if you're one of those businesses that sadly has fallen through the cracks. Yeah, it's the uncertainty, isn't it? Um, I heard bike sales are rising, though. Seeing your Atherton Bikes t-shirt there. Well, I mean, this is one of the companies I'm a founder of with the Athertons. And, you know, and it's the same thing where we were selling the first bikes and, you know, the supply chain has uh, been disrupted. The, you know, posting things around the world. We've got people buying these things all over the world. It's mm. been disrupted. We've had a, a board meeting talking about what we do in terms of COVID. And we've got a team, luckily, we haven't got huge overheads. Um, it's, it's a technology lets you to make things on a variable cost basis. We make each bike individually. So that's quite useful. We haven't got a container of bikes arriving from China. Mm -hmm. UK. So, you know, even I've, I'm involved in lots of businesses and there's somewhere I've got a good friend who's got a restaurant. I mean, yeah. he's not. So he's had to think long and hard about that. Luckily, there's a bit of help there from the government, which will um, hopefully tide them through. I've got various businesses. I've got a business I'm involved in this, in space. Uh, Charles said he might be watching, probably too busy. It doesn't really affect space, really, apart from the fact that yeah, it, it's venture funded and we need to keep an eye on liquidity, depending on how long this goes on. So mm -hmm. I'm involved in lots of businesses or people I know in business. I've got friends who've got a business that um, is in sort of IT and telecoms and they um, live probably in a, a million EBITDA. They've got um, venture, venture debt in there, equity finance, and they might need some working capital, but it's quite a lot of structure and C bills might not work for them. Not because they're they're not, it's not applicable to them, it's because they're trying to restructure their venture debt in terms of the priority of the ranking of security becomes uh, very complicated. So I've spoken to so many people in so many different um, um, situations. Some people I've spoken to are killing it, you know? Mm. The, 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 this they could have been better for their business. Mm. Yeah. Very different sectors. Um, so, you know, the, there's, there's a side to every coin. Yeah, we were talking um, crowdfunding yesterday uh, on here on the really? webinar, and it was uh, they just crowdfunded a fitness streaming business. And they're absolutely killing it. Everybody's downloading uh, yeah. fitness streaming yeah. apps, that kind of thing. Um, cool. Well, let's dive into. I've uh, probably got a dozen mm -hmm. questions already up here, so uh, do pop them on there um, if you've got a question. Um, so this one is. British Business Bank one related, which you're not in your official role, but you might be able to um, 
have a view. Is the British Business Bank approving the bank's lending decisions or are the banks doing that alone? For example, is British Business Bank setting rules around what the lending cover against the companies EBITDA need to meet to get approved for C-bills? No. So British Business Bank is it's not a bank. <laughs> That's a weird one. Yeah. It's actually a, a it's government owned 100 percent. And what the government does, it, it basically provides finance guarantees or backing to British Business Bank. And British Business Bank then below that has a, a sort of channel of delivery partners. So in this case, they are accredited lenders and different partners. So, you know, things like the invoice discounting, for example, as well as uh, loans and overdrafts. They then, um, in this case, they then, British Business Bank provides the guarantee. So this is where people, I, I think what happens with these situations is, is that there's an expectation gap. So there's, there's a crisis, your business needs money. You hear the government's providing, you know, government backed loans. And a lot of people think, oh great, I can go and get a loan, the government backs it, and I'm off to the races. It doesn't work like that. These are essentially commercial loans. What the government does is say to the lender, if and when you, um, the company, the business defaults, and you've done everything you can to recover that debt, which means um, coming after assets or you know even his personal guarantees and forcing those then we will then um, underwrite 80 percent of your loss so the banks can still lose 20 percent and they are still going to apply their typical commercial um, lending criteria which you know isn't going to work for companies that can't show how they trade out companies with insufficient cash flow and there's been a big conversation about security um, and personal guarantees. So the banks can offer unsecured loans below two hundred fifty thousand pounds. They don't. They didn't. They don't have to, but it's up to them. They can do. They can request for personal guarantees under the scheme. But a lot of the banks, if you read it in the media, have backed away from that. Now that might be good news, and the banks say, okay, normally we'd ask you for personal guarantee. In this instance, because we want to sort of do our bit, we're not going to. So that means that that turns a no into a yes. Hopefully what the banks don't do is say, well, yeah, normally we'd want a personal guarantee. We're not, we can't really ask you for one now. Um, so we're not gonna give you a loan. So I'm hoping it's not, it's the more of the former than the latter. Mm. But the British Business Bank is not involved in the decision to lend money. And in its equity business, because it also does, um, it provides finance to lots of venture capital funds. It's not involved in the financing, the investment decision the venture capital fund managers are. So that's something that people should understand. I'll get the BBB ones out of the way first then. Um, uh, hi Piers from Bilal, BBB has been using FinTech lenders to deploy funds to businesses over the years successfully. Why now are they not entertaining them to help SMEs get the government's 330 billion? Right, um, so yeah, so British Business Bank has provided finance on um, where to uh, outfits such as their funding circles, a good example, and other, other fintechs, yep. and you know, cash flow, cash flow advanced lenders, things like that. And again, it, it's about the British Business Bank doesn't make that that credit decision to make that investment. So really, if you look at uh, companies like Funding Circle, for example, they started off as peer to peer lenders, and then there was quite a lot of demand, so they started um, taking in money from the local authorities and British Business Bank. So there's kind of money there to put to work. But again, you know, they have a, a platform where they put um, their investments, the, the, the loans into different sort of risk um, hoppers and they have to manage that and make sure that they are, you know, correctly explaining to the, the both sides of that equation, the peer to peer, what the risk is in that loan. So they are going to check like any other bank that the, what the credit risk is and make loans um, that are appropriate on terms of interest rates that are appropriate too. So yeah. the, the, the thing is, is that if you could snap your fingers and create new structures and channels to market distribution routes, and you, you, there's lots of things you could do. The issue is in a crisis is that, this is my view, you have to use the channels that are available. So there's no point trying to reinvent the venture capital industry and put together a load of fund managers making investment decisions. There's no point trying to create, you suddenly create a bank that goes out and makes actual loans and get it regulated. I'll take a year to do it itself. Get it regulated and start making credit decisions. You're going to have to use the channels, be it banks, be it venture capital funds, whatever it may be, that already exist to expedite and speed up the process 
and getting money to people. You'll see that in the um, in the, the government scheme to uh, support in employees, they've used the POAE system. So in a way, employers are standing in um, for the state to almost you know, get financial support to employees. Again, mm -hmm. channel is a route to the people that need help. Trying to reinvent that will take forever. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and there's all sorts of complicated rules that I won't even bore you with about state aid and things like that that make things quite complicated. So mm -hmm. we are where we are. Um, I think the government has probably done as much as it can. Uh, these goalposts keep moving, um, depending on how the economy and small businesses react and how much help they get. You may see things change. I don't know at this time at all. And if I did, I probably couldn't tell you. So things may change, but for now, although it's not perfect, they I think they've done the best that they can. The yeah. reality is, is to in some ways, and I hate to say this, is to sort of take that on board and make decisions on where you go from here based on where we are, not where you'd like us to be. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good answer. Um, and with your investor hat on here, um, how do we try to find an investor now that this has happened from Ian? Um, my company looks like a sports company. We're starting to get a great brand going. There's a lot of interest um, in people investing, but this has now happened. My company's finances obviously is not as attractive to investors now. W what options would you would you recommend we look at? So, so the thing to understand is again is his glass on or not, is is um, the world is not going to stop turning. Um, and again, going back to my sort of um, metaphor at the beginning, the issue now is is that there's no real point. Now, I've got things I'm involved in where we're raising money for various businesses, and there's no point talking to investors right now. They're all at home, worried about their own health, the family's health, perhaps mm -hmm. their income. Maybe they've got other portfolios, for example, stock market portfolio that's you know halved in value. Who knows? Yeah. So everyone at the moment's worried, concerned, licking the wounds and uh, financial wounds if you've got money and worrying about you know your kids and your family and your parents. So you can forget it. Now, as we as that wave begins to crest and we start to be able to look over it at where the shore is, then you can start people are gonna start to sort of tentatively come out of their caves and look at what's going on around them and the world won't stop. So the point I'm making is again is that if you're trying to start a business and you're just about to start it, you know, you, you should think, think, think yourself lucky you didn't because this could have been terminal. Yeah. You are still thinking of starting a business and you think it's, there's a market and all the good things. By the way, I should mention, I made a course. I, was asked, I get asked the same questions, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought I'll make a course. I'll do a few videos. I ended up making 76 lessons and it's about 10 and a half hours of content. And you just 200 quid, but during the uh, pandemic, it's free. So if you go to startup.peerslinney.com or look on look at my social media for the, the link and use the code stay at home 100, then my course is free for the time being. Is that capitals, peers? I'll type it up here. Uh, I don't think it matters, but capitals is okay. what I use. We look at my uh, Twitter uh, or YouTube and the descriptions, you'll find links to all over the place. And the, the point there is that will give you, that will help you. So spend the time now perhaps is learning how you might start your business more efficiently. But the point I'm making is what we'll get to in a very labored way is if your business is, you've got a good idea and it holds water and it, it can sort of weather a recession. So you need to factor that into your plans that, you know, buying power is not going to be what it was six months ago. Then you've still got a, a business idea and there still will be investors out there. Mm -hmm. You've got to, pick your timing in terms of when you go and start having those conversations again. And if you've got people who are interested, keep talking to them, you know. I wouldn't really go ask them for cash, that might annoy them, but keep talking to them, keep them up to date, you know, keep in touch and, you know, make sure you are maintaining a relationship because the day may come back where they're kind of ready to start investing and you can close a deal you thought you were going to close or at least one close to it. You might find the investors, um, or try and reprice things, um, and that's up, that's up to you and them to have that discussion. But yeah. be realistic about it. the The world's not going to be the same probably for eighteen months. Yeah, maybe that answers the question. But do do sign up to my course and uh, spend the next few weeks at home, um, having me talking to you for ten hours. <laughs> yeah, well, never enough. Well, can't you relate? Because there's no real flashing lights and graphics, so you can actually just listen to it as a podcast. Really. Yeah, well, everyone's got more time on their hands, even if it's 
a time that you save commuting into the office and back a day, gaining an extra hour, whatever that might be. I've been learning to do Rubik's Cubes. I've learned to pick locks. Leave it alone. <laughs> it might come in handy if there's nothing in the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good life skill. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is about selling your business, um, Italo. I put my plans on hold because of the Brexit uncertainty. It was gearing up to market it a month ago. It's a small business. My question is whether there's any appetite similar from small time investors in general to buy companies. We're talking about small investment in the form of under 200,000. So probably answered by a previous question to a certain degree. Yeah, I've answered the question though. Yeah. I don't think, unless, you, unless you price it to go, and you find the right person that's cash rich. I mean, let's face it, right? There are lots of people who've got quite a bit of cash lying around, and this is a great time to be using it, but they're going to want a deal. So I think my previous yeah. answer probably covers that. Apart yeah. from you really need the money, you really are willing to price it to go, and you can find the right person with the who can write the check. Um, let's have a quick look. Uh, me and my partners are directors of our micro limited company. We run a plumbing and gas company. We've been told my partner can still work as a key worker um, for emergency situations. However, if he is only working for emergencies, which may or may not come, can we claim for any grants or loans? Well, I don't know about the, uh, the, yeah. the these things moving target, but the, the technical key, um, yeah, and the POA as well, and depending how you depending how you pay yourself as well. Is it POE? Do you pay yourself dividends? All this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think also you've got to be working at fifty percent of your time, particular business. So there's all sorts of rules you need to dig into, um, which are on the website, on the government websites, to work out whether it applies. But if you're a key worker, typically, um, you, you're in a better position than most other people. So I won't pretend to know the exact detail of that, but yeah, look at really how you pay yourself, and the people that are falling through the cracks. Uh, there are many, many people that set up a limited mm. company. Um, they have various clients, or even one or two, and then they pay themselves dividends as opposed to POE. Yeah. Very hard for the government to, or anybody to distinguish between investment income, dividends, and, in, and dividends you take for income to put food on the table. It's the same thing. It's derived through your, your ownership structure. Mm. So they've kind of shied away from that, which I think, I, don't, I can't see that changing really, because it's just, too complicated and i know it's tricky isn't it because it's probably the most posts i've seen on social media being people who've literally fallen through through that kind of crap by the way they pay themselves the dividends uh... yeah i think you'll find that they're gonna i think the chancellor said this they're gonna change the national insurance to equalize it with poe i think you'll find more people paying themselves even through their own companies and you've got ir35 as well with all this kind of stuff which is related which has um, been delayed People start paying themselves through POE, I think. But most people are accountants and they tell you to be in that situation to pay yourself a certain amount of POE and then the remainder is dividends. Um, let's finish uh, this one. So Matthew says, uh, is there a competitive market between the providers of C bills? If my bank demands bad terms or too much in person guarantee, am I likely to get a better deal at one of the other 39 providers? But yeah, so it, it, is the, it is the open commercial lending market. Um, and so it's, there's no point talking to one. I would talk to maybe three of them, the big one, uh, one of the challenger banks, uh, and sometimes the specialist ones, like, you know, for invoice discounting, for example, but talk to a few of them. They've all got their own lending criteria. So that will depend on their risk appetite. It'll depend on the terms, for example, the interest rate. It'll depend on the security, um, depend on their cost of capital. So there's lots of um, different reasons why I might change the terms in which they're willing to write loans. Obviously, within the market, there's kind of a there's, there's a, a sweet spot in which they probably all operate in terms of structure, security, and pricing. So don't expect it to be completely different. Um, but it's worth talking to more than one of them. There's no government control over uh, the terms. The government's obviously trying to. And then, you know, the press and public pressure to incentivize lenders to put money to work. But at the end of the day, it's their decision. Yeah, indeed. Um, and so, well, that, so the, the, a general point, actually, if, I want to get it across is that there are lots of different ways of structuring um, investment for your business, right? So if you're not talking to institutions like banks or venture capital funds, you're talking to individuals, this may go back to the chap who's looking for investment. Mm. There's things like um, convertible loans. So 
a convertible loan. The problem we've got, we've got at the moment is, is that a lot of small businesses are getting crash courses in corporate finance. They never thought they were going to raise loans or talk to banks need a business plan. And suddenly they're finding they are. So a convertible loan, the idea is, is that you provide, um, you, you give a loan, somebody provides capital. It might be higher interest because there's more risk. Otherwise you go to a bank. They you provide a loan. And if the company is sort of not doing particularly well, they'll put a hold on to that, that loan. They want it to be paid plus interest over time. If the company starts to do really, really well, they have an option to convert the loan into shares in the business. So again, it only works if you've got a business where the plan is down the line to exit by listing on the stock market or selling it so they can get their money back out. So if they convert into equity, what they then do is they don't got a loan anymore, but they then they enjoy that, that upside, that significant growth in the value of their investment. So mm -hmm. they have that optionality. And you can agree convertible loans with private investors typically. Um, they are taking... They're taking a risk because, you know, in the day you might not be able to generate the cash flows you want or raise the, the um, future round of finance that you need. So there's more risk involved. Another one is an advanced subscription agreement. So this is where you take on equity. So for example, you've got an interested investor. They want to invest in the business. They're like you because that's what they're investing in typically at this point. Um, but right now, the, the world's on fire and they don't really know how to go about it. So in a couple of weeks, when people are looking at what to do again, you go and talk to them and say, look, I want you to invest. Let's do the deal. I know it's difficult to price. I'm going to raise more money, which is the plan. And again, you've got to be the kind of company that's looking the next sit down the line. Um, put your money in. When I raise the next, the other finance, we will then look at the valuation then. And then I will then price your investment at a discount to that valuation to here. So you might be saying, I'm making this up as I go along, that I want to raise, you know, £100,000, say, um, I'll take £100,000 off you. I'm going to raise, I need another £200,000 when the, the, the world's in a better shape. If that's at a higher valuation, then that's great. It's good news. But basically, they're going to get, they're going to discount their investment to that valuation. And all that really does is delay the pricing discussion to mm. a future date and they get a discount to it. So it's not a loan, it's not a convertible, it's just delaying the pricing conversation and yeah. pricing it based on a valuation that's set when the world is uh, in better shape. So that might work. There's, yeah. lots, there's lots of ways you can structure these things, but there are two examples. No, it's a good one. Um, it's a question from uh, Steve. We are an online retailer where we manufacture and import. We sell on various EC platforms. We're meant to, can stay open, but are struggling whether we should. We actually closed last week, but now our income stream is zero. No, that's an easy one, isn't it? And going back to my opening analogy, if you were on the call then, is getting over the crest this way so you can plan. So, you know, there's no point, if you can, and I've said this in my last webinar as well uh, with the Festival of Enterprise, is that go through your management accounts, every line, whether it's stamps, you know, subscriptions and newspapers, rent rate, lights, whatever, and to have conversations with all of your suppliers and your creditors even say, can I mitigate this cost? Can I reduce it? Can I defer it, delay it? Just have those conversations. Now, clearly, people keep talking about delaying and deferring things. And that, that just is push out the issue into the future. Mm. And you have a cash crunch down the line if revenues don't come back as quickly as you want them to. But my my advice is, that, and the key one I'd like to get across in this call is, if you're in a real sticky situation and you're looking at all the government help, nothing really applies and it might not, your revenue's dried up, um, mothball your business. You know, even yeah. just for a couple of weeks, just get over the hump so that you can see how far away the land is and then you can start to plan more accurately. Right now, it's impossible to really put a plan together. So I would, you know, don't let your business go if you can afford to, because, you know, as we all know, you can spend years of your life building these things and start it again. So what I mean saying, oh, it's a good opportunity to start a new business again or rethink or reassess how you go about it. We all know if you spend five years building a business, blood, sweat and tears, you don't want to go through that again, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so mothball it, um, learn from the experience, and then try and bring it back to life. But another thing is, piece of advice is, is and I've been guilty of myself, it's very easy to stick your head in the sand, hoping that this will all go away, mm -hmm. the government will come out with some amazing scheme that just gives away free money, which is highly unlikely, 
um, and you stick your head in the sand. Don't, you know. The thing about crisis management is, is you know, you need to sort of face up to the facts and take action and make decisions, even if they're painful. Mm. A couple that I've been involved in, they've had some conversations with people and let them go on, on Monday after conversations over the weekend. But, um, you know, not easy to do, but they've had to do it to save the business for another day. Yeah, and I think something we were going to touch on before as well, um, you know, that, that many people at the moment have been furloughed and are at home, you know, not allowed to work, despite um, some bosses maybe asking them to do various bits and pieces. But um, those who've got a side hustle um, or have always thought of starting a business, what do you think of the current climate? And again, the, your analogy of the wave is a really good one, but what do you think people's appetites, current climate, et cetera, for actually starting a business? So I think it's a fantastic time to think about starting a business. I mean, you know, what this is showing you that, you know, job security is an oxymoron. It just doesn't exist. It might be the economy. You know, who would have thought it'd be a pandemic? This won't be the last pandemic. No. It'll be worse down the line, trust me, probably in our lifetime. So, you know, job security is something that is going away rapidly. And I put out on my social media in the past that, you know, we, we talk about the gig economy and Uber drivers and delivery drivers and, you know, there's privateer, Amazon delivery people. That's coming for all of us. You know, no organization really wants employees on a full-time contract. And down the line, what this has also shown, I think, the good news is, is that you can work from anywhere in most most information economy businesses. Clearly, if you're driving a four-lift truck, that's not going to work. So the world's changing. And why? And, and if it's going to change, and I guess a lot of people watching this webinar are quite young, in your lifetime, the employment employment is going to change dramatically. So why not get ahead of the game and think about starting a business now? And this is a great time to do your research on a side hustle. Yeah. I've got a friend, I think he might be watching actually, and he, he's got a full-time job. And he said, look, he's got an Amazon business where he found a product. It's a product that's got a decent price, um, reasonable price, and what it is, 20, 30 quid, whatever it is, decent margin, has it made in China? I guess it tweaks slightly. It's delivered to the UK. It's held in um, you know, someone that checks the um, ch check the right products being shipped and there's quality assurance on it. It's then shipped by them to Amazon, held in Amazon by FBA. That's fulfillment by Amazon. And they do all the pick packing and posting. All he does is marketing on social media and on Amazon itself. And he's got a business there and it will take time to grow. But, you know, it's a good side hustle. Now, that might not be what he ends up doing long term. Uh, but what, what, what you do, though, is you learn. And unless you've actually run a business, no matter how small it is, even if it's a simple Amazon uh, business like that, is that you, you don't understand the mechanics of it and also how difficult it can be as well. So my advice is if you've got any inclination at all to start a business, this is the time to do it. There'll be no better time. You've got no other time like this to, as long as you've got a key worker and you're in you know, a hospital ward, like my cousin today who's a, a COVID ward lead, she hasn't got time to do this, but mm. think about what interests you, um, what gets you out of bed, um, especially in, the, in, the, in these situations. What would you like to do? What interests you? What are you passionate about? And try and build a business around. I don't really like the word side hustle because it sounds like it's hustle. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a business. So try and start a business. And what you'll do is learn whether running a business is, is for you. And, and that's not for everyone. Yeah. No, I, th I think you're right. I think you look at what you're, what you're passionate about, what you're good at, you know, where your um, where your expertise may lie, and where, where those two things. And also, if it's not, I've got a, uh, some people around here I met. There, one's a soldier, got a senior soldier, so he's working, obviously, um, guarding uh, supermarkets, probably. But he's working, and his wife's got an online business selling um, and gets kids fashion accessories or something, whatever it may be. And she's fine. Mm. You know, people are at home now. They haven't got as much money, but there's more of them at home thinking about spending. So. On average, I think everything has gone up. Yeah, it's funny. I was, I was look, thinking back like to the last um, recession and thinking businesses that came out of that that were doing incredibly well, like the Airbnbs, you know, WeWork, Uber, and you think, wow, what a difference a decade makes. Well, it's a good time to start a business because if it works in the recession, then it's going to work on the other side of the recession because um, you know it's a good time to test your. And again, you know. It's, Starting a business, this is probably a different webinar now, but starting a business is, it's about testing a hypothesis. It's not always going to work, you know. 
you might need to do in the kind of Amazon businesses is that you can try a product, you can market it, you can price it. It doesn't work or the margin's too low at the right price. So you try another one and you just keep going until you find one that works. Even when you start a business, you might find that it's your second or third business that actually really motors and succeeds. Mm. So I would, you know, people read about wealthy people who've been in business, you know, if you're not on the pitch kicking the ball about, you're not going to score goals. So just get on the pitch, even if it's small, and just have a go. Yeah, you need to be in the game. Absolutely. And there, any industries that um, particularly you think are attractive at the moment that you've uh, you've seen? No, I think it's um, it's, it's very. I've been looking at things like you know wellness and well being, so that yeah. big industries, and, and it's kind of probably shown recently that you know the IT industry, how you work from home, is a good one to be in. But there's lots of sectors that are of interest. But the key thing is got to be something which you're interested in. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to get out of bed every day, working 18 hours a day, six days a week, something that you're not really bothered about. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions come through. Um, I haven't read it through, but it's quite a long one. As sole director of a micro limited company it appears, my husband is unable to access any salary support. He pays PYE and dividends. If he furloughs, he cannot work whatsoever apart from statutory returns. No work, no income. He's set to work uh, as limited company. Clients will not work with self-employed, etc. Why is the government treating self-employed? Kind of goes back to what we we're saying and, and micro limited companies so differently. Should there be plans to address this? How would you suggest he overcomes this predicament so the point is with the government is is that the the it's like the healthcare system and my cousin who's a covid ward lead she was telling me a long time ago that you know healthcare as a system it works for the population on mass so overall you improve the lives of the population the healthcare system may kill you because you get something wrong now bad analogy perhaps but the point is is that with with finance it's impossible for the government to drill down in the timeframes we're talking about and create some way of supporting absolutely everybody. Yeah. And the problem with dividends is, and this is, the, this is where people have really slipped through the cracks on this one, is that the advice normally is if you can have a limited company with various clients is, you know, you pay yourself some POE up to a certain limit and then you pay yourself in dividends. And that's because it's tax efficient overall compared to paying yourself all POE and all the NI, um, you pay less tax overall. And that's typical advice. So a lot of people do that. The problem is, is that when you pay dividends out, if you own the company 100%, obviously to you, you're paying dividends out as income to put food on the table and then do whatever you want to do with it. Whereas a dividend legally is a share of profits outcomes. So if you've got two shareholders and one's got 60% and one's got 40%, this is some legal arrangement that changes this, the whatever profit you pay out at the top gets split that way. That's why very large public companies, they pay out dividends of a couple of points, which, you know, which in some cases, millions, billions of pounds even, and it gets distributed amongst their shareholders. That's investment income. You as a, a sole trader, essentially, working through a limited company, that's income, really. It's income you use to live off. But it's very hard legally, because it's a dividend, to distinguish between the two. Because that income is derived through share ownership, not necessarily through um, blood, sweat and tears and turning up at 9 a.m. every morning somewhere to do something. And it's very hard for the government to come up with a, a structure which is able fairly and quickly to distinguish between the two. And I don't think that's going to change. Um, and it is a problem, but it's like I said before, you are where you are, and it sounds like you're in a, a bit of a spot there. So mm. I know if you are a proud entrepreneur and you've been building a business, you don't want to go and talk to people about, you know, tax credit, universal credit, sometimes income support. But, you know, there are schemes there where you may be able to get some support and some kind of advanced um, payments. And then I think it's people like yourself where, you know, you need to work out this gets wave again is there anything you can do to see as you can look over the top of it and say right the world looks like this now how on earth can you reboot the business yeah. and uh going back to my earlier point is if you have to mothball it rather than lose it yeah and here's one i think you, you probably cover in um in your course actually which you're uh I've put the link on here that I found on your on your LinkedIn actually for everyone to access for free in the in the code. Um, so uh, we're a charity providing music education to over five and a half thousand school aged children. 
Our work had to cease due to schools being closed and so we'd like to take our services online and aim to reach a much larger audience for a smaller charge per person. We have the IT infrastructure ready to go, but do you have any advice for us on how to structure our online charging model? Well, the first thing is charities, I mean, let's forget about people paying themselves dividends, charities and third sector businesses are even a bigger hole. Yeah. Because, you know, A, no one's, you know, they can't raise debt, they can't raise equity. And let's face it, there's no one really throwing change into people shaking cans on the streets at the minute. So donations have fallen off a cliff. Now, the good news is it sounds like you only want to use you know, technology to do something. So what's the, what's the charity again? What does it do? Um, it was providing music education. Yeah, so you want to think about, for a start, are people going to pay for that right now? So you might want to spend some time planning a bit more. But there's also different charging models. There's nothing new under the sun. And you know, if you go on my course, actually, I can just cover some of this. But you know, you've got the, the models where the most valuable model is subscription. So people forget that you know Amazon charges, is it you know, six, seven pounds or ten dollars a month for Prime? Yeah. Is, 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 is it 200 million people in the US? I want mm -hmm. billions coming in the door already before they deliver anything. So the most valuable model for revenue in terms of you want to build a business that's worth something and it is, it's um gives you more comfort and your revenue security over time and it's worth more if you want to sell it okay it's a charity so it could be not the case but i'll keep this generic your subscriptions because it comes to the door every month now you've got to have something whereby it's suitable for subscriptions if you're sending someone you know a book for example then you know probably not suitable source for subscription if you're sending them uh, something which has value over time and changes and gets added to or um, improved over time, then you can charge a subscription. Which you possibly can, I'm sure this is your model if it's online, is charge a subscription. And then what you get into is the kind of freemium, premium model. So do you charge, is it free up to a certain point to get people interested, to entice them, to log them in? Then you charge them for more. You know, you see games doing this a lot mm -hmm. in-app purchases. But the freemium model is I think it's you've got to be crystal clear though on day one that the freemium or the the cheaper version um, is is cheaper for a reason and to get the the premium model is they've got to pay more. You've got to explain clearly why they're going to pay that difference, that differential, and that's about adding value. So the more value you can add, the more you can show that that there's a good reason for them to upgrade, then that's where you can. Um, convert customers and build a relationship. No point until I'm making a huge surprise or they find out that they've signed up for something that's not worth more, worth much more. What you then get is churn. You get customers just churning all the time. Mm -hmm. So subscription business grows um, very, very quickly because your revenue, if you have a shop that's selling you know, pens, on the 1st of January every year, you start with zero revenue. You've got to sell pens. If you've got a subscription business, on the 1st of January, you've got the same revenue you had times 12 in December. Mm. We'll be averaged out depending on what your December month like because of Christmas. So think about that. Think about how do you get customers interested, um, free or cheap, and how do you then upgrade them onto more um, expensive to them, but more profitable to you um, service plans? And this is all quite obvious stuff, but that's the way to do it. Mm. Um Pre, on a return to my previous question, uh, this is Ian again, looking at fresh start for my company, the original investment opportunity was good financial. Now this event has changed everything. Would it be more wise to perhaps gain a bigger, better investor offering an option in with no actual financial input? So someone who could add greater value to the company with experience and contacts that would actually take the business forward rather than take a year or two to gain momentum again. Well, so that's a nice problem to have. So the key thing is, is to get the money. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you haven't got a business. Second thing really is, is to get the money on the right term. So it doesn't really matter what relations you've got with this person, you know, whether you go on holiday with them or, you know, went to their children's um, birthday party, it doesn't matter. You've got, you've got a shareholder agreement or an investment agreement or a loan agreement, depending on what the structure is. And that really is what dictates your relationship at the end of the day. So if you fall out or the world's upside down, they want to get their money back and you just don't know. So the key thing is make sure you, you've got, you get the money, get it on terms that are acceptable to you. So both in terms of dilution, how much they take of the company, how much you're left with, but read the small print. So I'm an ex-lawyer. 
and I've seen too many um, entrepreneurs, uh, even now they uh, have conversations, oh, I've just raised a million pounds and look at me, aren't I clever? And I read the small print and I know that within three years, they probably won't be working for their own business and they definitely won't be owning any of it. So I can just tell by the structure that what those investors are trying to do. So the third thing then is, and it's a nice thing to have, is that investors are A, of, of, of investing in your business, B, on terms you're both happy with, so it's you've met in the middle, and C, they can add value, and maybe be on your board, be a non-exec director. But I, I'd look at it in the cold light of day, almost in that order. Thank you very much. Um, and this was just asking your, your personal opinion. Um, which is how long do you think it's going to take for the global economy to return to pre-COVID levels once the virus is under control and in decline across the world? Do you think it will be fairly quick or are we looking at a fundamental impact that will take years to recover from? So we need the answer to that. My background will be my own, my own island. <laughs> but uh, I think re realistically, right, um, let's, let's just re rewind. So we're not really going to be in the in the all clear. So there's two things actually, there's a pandemic and there's a recession. Let's talk about pandemic. So pandemic, we're not really gonna be in the clear until there's it, treatments actually have an impact. That's, that's one, but more vaccine. And that's probably still 15, 12, 15 months away. Either the expedited, probably because of the, the clinical trials that need to happen to make sure that when you deploy these things to whole populations, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have a negative effect on a huge, a huge percentage to those people as well. So that's the first thing. So if you backtrack them, then we're looking at probably lockdown for another month to six weeks, perhaps, depending if they can flatten that, that curve. Then you're looking at still, you know, the, the lights coming back on pretty slowly. So I think you've got six months, really, of people not really being clear on um, what's happening. And then there's going to be a whole conversation about, well, when we come out of this, what's the recession going to look like? What's the impact going to be? Which sectors are going to be hit the hardest? How long is it going to go on for? How deep is it going to be? So you can have that issue as well. What's investor sentiment going to be like in terms of debt and equity as well? So you've got that. That's going to take time. So you've probably got 18 months of recession after that. So I think you've got six months until we really know where the shore is. Going back to my earlier metaphor analogy about how far we get over the hump and we start planning to get to shore, you've probably got 12 to 13 months till we've actually got a, some kind of vaccine where it can be cleaned up. Mm. What we're thinking about then, you've got a recession going into you know, 2022, and how does that impact things? Yeah. yeah. So they're all gonna be intertwined, so it makes it quite complicated, but you know, I think the government has to um, take us along on a journey and they can't sort of tell us the bad news very, very quickly. Mm. I just don't think this is going to be over and done with in a month. No. Or three. No, indeed. Um, Kelly, last questions coming in. So Alexandra says, um, two parts. So any tips on promoting virtual social events quickly um, would be brilliant. Any marketing advice? If you're moving social events to online using Zoom, do you need to change your T's and C's, bearing in mind I've added the event description using Zoom as a third party? I mean, so it's essentially the, the first question actually. So essentially, your know, marketing is um, something you're gonna, you're gonna have to try and put money into until you find that what the ROI is, what actually works for your business. So there's no, there's no easy way of just converting, a, a, say, an offline business to an online business. And you know, using social media is great. The, the key is, is cutting through the noise. Yeah. I've got like an Instagram account. I've got like 5,000 followers, not a huge amount. And I kind of put content out all the time and it never really moves. The minute you pay, the minute you, you know, you sort of promote your posts, boom, things start ticking up. So it's a question online is, and this is the beauty of online marketing of the day. Again, it's in my course, Alex, there's a whole section on this, is that you get almost an instantaneous ROI, return on investment. You spend £10, £50, £500, you know whether that campaign, that creative, that copy, whether it worked and extent to which it worked. Now, I know people that are um, in marketeers and they, they love marketing, but they can't stand data and numbers. And that's where it's going. So you might have 
some creative and the copy it all needs to work clearly and match your brand but then really it's about data and numbers and just try things and see what works but the thing is you've got to find something that cuts through the noise because there's just so much of it and a lot of the platforms out there that allow you to um you know make event organization and selling tickets like event brides also big ones as well very very simple but the marketing really is down to you being creative mm. finding a way of, of getting through the amazing noises out there and just try things and, and also don't don't throw found to quit or something you know the beauty of online marketing you can do a 10 20 50 pounds try it see what works and when you know what really works there's a, there's a positive return on your investment then scale it mm. yeah because as you said cutting through cutting through the noise when the likes of facebook are only letting five ten percent of your followers actually see your free posts um it's becoming a pay-to-play game isn't it I don't do Facebook, I can't bother. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I probably need to, I should do, I'll probably end up getting someone to do it for me. I, I just don't, don't touch it. But I've done a bit of Instagram, which is Facebook, I suppose. My Facebook. Own by, yeah. So you can't really say you don't do Facebook because they own WhatsApp and Instagram. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, and the thing about marketing is, is that marketing is a, it's a, especially digital marketing. Yes, there's creative and copy and all that stuff, but it's, it's a science, it's data. Mm. And um, I've been working on one business actually and talking to some data scientists, actually the, the professor that actually wrote the book on it, literally. And uh, it's fascinating seeing that, you know, marketing now is now moving away from being, you know, marketing into data scientists. Mm. Numbers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, last question, unless there's another one coming in from Craig. Um, who says, as the MD from a manufacturer of environmental monitoring equipment, we are international, exporting to over 80 countries and have been hit hard due to China being the first downturn market for us. Three months on, China is starting to brush themselves off and are now starting to place orders. The rest of the world is starting to face what China already has been through. It's hard times, but there is light at the end of the tunnel in China. Uh, for us, the situation is hard in Europe at the moment, but as we get near the top of the slope in sea land, things will improve. I mean, that's a great example of a great business. Sounds like you're in a, a great space. Mm. What you don't want to do is, is lose it because of this six months of, of, of actual real pain. And I think what you're doing is, 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 you know, is think about how do you take those hard decisions, take action, you know, lock down the business costs as well as being locked down yourself, but go through it, make the difficult decisions and make sure you get through to the top of that wave so you can see the shore then you can start to plan. I think your final supply chain begins to write that ship a lot faster than the markets you want to sell into. So mm -hmm. you think about that. Be careful when you start turning costs on. Don't be, again, people teaching suck eggs here, you've got a sensible business, I think, is don't try and be too optimistic and turn all the costs on before you really, really know that your market and your customers are willing to start spending again. So it's about getting that, getting that balance right. But it sounds like you've got a great example of business with the future there so hang on to it yeah that, that's that's good to hear craig like my just from my point of view where with business that i run as a podcast agency like a couple of clients uh cancelled because they were manufacturers in in china so it's, that's nice to hear you know they push their plans back to next year but maybe we'll see people can see this you know the downturn has been you know outridden then um Things will pick up for, for everybody so that's, uh, that's nice to have somebody post in a positive post like that craig and we we wish you all the very best um just to finish up then maybe mike uh we've asked our mortgage lender if we can go interest only for a short period the answer was yes but they said the account would show in arrears not very helpful when we do large amounts of borrowing any ideas is that a business or personal I think it must be a business then um well i mean to be honest with you the you know, credit ratings, um, all these people, the 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 the, mood, the rating agencies, they're going to have to have think about this very, very long and hard because almost everyone's credit is going to be in the toilet. So yeah. and this is corporate as well as personal. So it's a question of if you're going to have late payments. So they're going to have to have some kind of moratorium or something or some understanding about what actually happened during a particular period of time. Obviously, I don't really know the ins and outs of your particular mortgage and the structure and relationship and who it's with and where we, what the business is and the assets and the equity and the debt and all that stuff. But um, good to have those decisions. But 
there's going to be a bigger discussion, I think, somehow. I haven't seen much about it yet, about what's going to happen on credit scoring and rating agencies. Yeah. I think, sadly, that's probably beyond our pay grade. Yeah, yeah. That, that is going to be a huge question, 100%, um, when that comes out. We don't know. Um, and any closing remarks, Piers, or we're coming yeah, up? Well, yeah, no one's going across, I think, is that this, this, this feels like Armageddon. It's, it's all doom and gloom. You can't pick up anything without reading about COVID and, you know, and sadly people are losing their lives. But from a business perspective, you need to, you know, understand that two things really. One is there's no point sticking your head in the sand and pretending it's all going to go away and then the government are going to come out with some 100% back loan scheme or they're going to start investing in venture capital direct into small cap businesses or small businesses, or micro businesses even. I could be wrong. I just don't see it happening. So you've got to face up to realities that you are where you are. If you pay yourself via dividends, I can't see the government fixing that very easily. So you are where you are as well. So that's the one thing is, is take action based on what you know today. Don't wait any longer before you take those actions because it's just going to make things get more complicated. Talk to your, your people in your personal finance. Talk to your investors, your lenders. Go for your management accounts. Talk to everybody. Can you mitigate, delay, defer, reduce all your costs? Can you, as some of you have talked about, can you be creative with your revenues? Can you move your business online? Now, that might take, weirdly, um, some, a bit of investment. Uh, might be a huge amount. But you might need to invest to, to get through, which can be quite complicated for some people to get their head around, but think about that. And the key point, the last point really is, is to, if your business is in trouble and you really can't see how you can get through this, is, you know, don't just give up on it, is try and mothball it, try and have those conversations, make the difficult decision to save the business, to get to the top of this wave, this crest, this hump, whatever you want to call it, so we can see how we get out of this and what the future looks like and how it's going to end. Then you can start to plan more accurately and more effectively as I'm conversations about um, funding your business. If you've got a startup idea and you've been talking to investors, don't give up on it. The world will come back. It's just a question of picking your picking your timing. I've had people on LinkedIn messaging me all the time saying, oh, Piers, you want to invest this and do that? And I'm like, no, I'm actually more focused on what I'm going to see my kids. Yeah. So you know, just don't, don't annoy people. Just give it a bit of time, mm. but do what you can to ensure your business survive to the other side because the good news is it's business uh, and it is war is probably going to find less competition so be there if you possibly can well i found that really helpful uh from a personal point of view and i'm sure you know the amount of questions we've had flying in um somebody's even had time in between questions to check out the atherton story they said um <laughs> atherton bikes crazy <laughs> they're, um, they're, I mean, again, they're um, elite athletes. I've really worked with elite athletes before, and they have a particular work ethic. But you know, every business I've been involved in, one way or the other, a couple are killing it because of what they do. Mm. Um, but most of them, even this one, we've had board meetings. I'm on the board where we had to, you know, just have a cold town discussion about, you know, to how does it impact us and what do we do about it? And with this business, it's more about the sales as opposed to the you no know, real issue with it. But everyone needs to have those discussions yeah it's, it's just it's just good governance even if you've got a small business and you know, you're having board meetings with yourself just you know have the conversation with yourself but it's just, just good governance to go through the options go through the scenarios and think about how you're going to react to them then you have less surprises indeed uh lo lots of comments saying thank you Piers. going to check out your course thank you very much Piers. going to check out the course thank you thank you brilliant literally thank got about 30 40 questions on there guys if we miss the odd question do apologize um that we try to get on bills just look at the previous webinar i did a whole presentation yes on. good point yeah good point. there's a lot of it um, i don't think much has changed since then in terms of the structure yeah you, so you can go to Piers's youtube channel and he's got the um video from that and we went about 90 minutes i think in the end on that answering all the questions yeah. about c bills and lots of other stuff as well um so yeah go go and check that one out so good luck stay at home and um i'll see you on the other side see you on the other side thank you Piers. Cheers, thank bye. you everybody